Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Pennsylvania Press Club. I'm Francine Scherzer, president of the Pennsylvania Press Club and your host for today's luncheon. Joining me at the head table is Warren Hudak of Hudak & Company. Thank you for your support and thank you for being here. The Pennsylvania Press Club luncheon series could not be possible without the support of the generous sponsors listed on the sponsor banner. Today's luncheon is being taped and will be carried throughout Pennsylvania to the television audience of PCN. Our speaker today is Jim Lee, President and CEO of Susquehanna Polling and Research. Susquehanna Polling and Research is a nationally recognized survey research and polling firm headquartered in Pennsylvania and specializes in a full range of research services for business and state agencies, national and state trade associations, hospitals and health systems, candidates for public office and media outlets. The firm conducts polling in more than 30 states. Founded in 2000, SPNR includes a team of research associates with more than 50 years of combined experience, including telephone agents, focus group recru recruiters, and other consultants. Susquehanna Polling and Research acquired the Bartlett Research Group in 2016, a Harrisburg area focus group company that has been conducting qualitative research and focus group services for a wide range of national and state clients since 1986. SPNR's publicly released polling has been quoted in numerous national platforms including Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, the Rush Limbaugh radio program, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and USA Today. SPNR was profiled by C CBS's Inside Edition on two separate episodes for its unmatched accuracy in the 2020 battleground polling. And nationally acclaimed polling aggregator Real Clear Politics rated SPNR the number one most accurate polling firm in the nation for its accuracy in the 2020 presidential election in multiple states. Jim earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Lycoming College and has 12 credits earned toward an MPA program at Shippensburg University. Jim resides in Thompsontown, Juniata County with his wife, Dr. Megan Kurlicek, and has two daughters, Ava and Alexis, ages 19 and 15. We bring to you Jim Lee. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Francine, and thank you to Francine, PCN, and the entire Press Club family for the generous invitation to speak today. And a special thank you to Christine Corrigan for the great effort she puts into planning and managing these luncheons month in and month out. I'd also like to thank our clients. Yeah, absolutely. Wherever she is. I don't, there she is. I'd also like to thank our clients, supporters, and executive staff who are here today, including distinguished guests, State Senators Ryan Ament and Judy Ward. <laughs> the date was January 20th, 1953. The 33rd President of the United States was preparing his exit from the White House after a less than stellar presidency. Harry S. Truman instead turned to his postmaster general and said, quote, I'd like to have a postage stamp made with my face on it to commemorate my time in office. The postmaster general quipped that it was probably a lousy idea, but agreed nonetheless had the stamp manufactured and sent out to the masses. A few weeks later, the postmaster general approached the retired president with some unfortunate news. He said, Mr. President, it seems the stamps aren't working as we intended. What's the problem, inquired Truman. The Postmaster General responded, the problem is that people are spitting on the wrong side of the stamp. <laughs> I thought this joke about spitting on the wrong side of the stamp would be a perfect segue into a discussion of Trump and Biden in the presidential race here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> But first, let's consider the relevance of what we have this year when we compare back to a similar series of events in 1888. That year, Indiana Republican Senator Benjamin Harrison defeated incumbent Democrat President and New York native Grover Cleveland. Harrison actually lost the popular vote to Cleveland, but Harrison won the Electoral College by a commanding 233 to 168 margin. Harrison went on to become, at the time, the third president in history to lose the popular vote but win the electoral vote. So after the 1888 election, we fast forward to the 1892 election four years later, where we now have incumbent President Harrison facing off against former President 
Grover Cleveland. This time around, former President Cleveland defeats Harrison. Cleveland did, in fact, win the popular vote and the Electoral Vote College that year, Cleveland winning 277 electoral votes, or about 5.5 million votes cast, Harrison winning only 145 electoral votes, or about 5.2 million votes cast. But perhaps very telling was that many don't know there was a third-party candidate on the ballot that year as well, a one James Weaver running as the People's Party candidate. He actually siphoned off a million votes, which could presumably have been the difference in the race. So taking all that into consideration, now we have a former president facing off against an incumbent president. But because of the apparent disdain for both candidates, there are attempts to alter the dynamics of the race with the advent of a formidable no labels party unity ticket, a reputable third party ticket who was able to get on the ballot in multiple swing states could make the difference in the outcome. Candidates like anti-COVID vaccine activist and environmental lawyer Robert F. Kennedy, or academic activist Cornell West, or Green Party activist Jill Stein, are current prospects mounting independent bids for the White House. The No Labels movement is still in the planning stages and has voted to continue its cause but hasn't picked any candidates yet. To date, the No Labels movement has qualified for the ballot in 22 states, including three swing states, but hopes to be on the ballot in 33 states by the time the summer rolls around. And let's not forget in 2020 here in Pennsylvania, Biden carried the Keystone State by only 82,000 votes over Donald Trump. His margin was tiny. But many forget there was a third party candidate on the ballot as well that year. Someone named Dr. Joe Jorgensen, a Clemson University psychology professor who ran as the Libertarian Party candidate. Want to know how many votes she got? 79,380 total votes, almost enough to equal the difference between Biden and Trump's margin. As a Libertarian, presumably these votes were votes she probably cost Donald Trump more than Biden. And some may even forget how consequential the third party vote was during the 2016 presidential election here in Pennsylvania between Clinton and Trump. Trump carried the Keystone State by 44,000 votes that year. But Green Party candidate Jill Stein, who I referenced earlier, was also on the ballot and got 50,000 votes that otherwise probably would have gone to Clinton. So the impact someone like Jorgensen or other third party candidates can have on the presidential race is real and immediate and could be a deciding factor. But if you don't believe me when I say there is widespread disdain for our current choices for president, let's consider for a moment the real testimonials of undecided voters in the race for president. I'd like to play you a video clip of what undecided voters in our focus group mainly those who are loath to support either Biden or Trump, are saying about the upcoming election. In this clip, undecided voters are asked to volunteer a single word that describes how they feel about the choices they have in the election. Let's listen in to what they have to say. favorable towards both Biden and Trump, double haters, and their ultimate choice of who they will support on election day will be consequential. Nationally, Trump leads Biden by two points or a margin of 47 to 45 percent, 
according to a composite average of publicly released polling by Real Clear Politics. With independents and third party candidates West, Stein, and Kennedy in the picture, Trump maintains or even widens his lead, which shows most of this third party vote could end up hurting Biden more than Trump. However, Kennedy's position as a strident anti COVID vaccine candidate could have some crossover appeal with many MAGA voters. It's these same voters who consider themselves anti government and fervently opposed strong state mandates during the COVID years, like we saw in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and California under Democratic governors who, according to many Republicans, ruled with an iron fist. But Biden's lagging poll numbers is a real problem for the incumbent. First, his approval rating nationally is only 40%, while much higher 55% disapprove of the job he's doing. Moreover, only one in four voters think the country is moving in the right direction, according to a recent New York Times poll. Plus, more than twice as many voters believe Biden's policies have personally hurt them as believe his policies have helped them, according to the same poll. And a majority of voters think the economy is in poor shape despite the many metrics showing otherwise. So Americans' trepidation about the economy is manifesting in Biden's very dismal poll numbers. And to put this in perspective, we polled the, we polled the job approval scores for all presidents approximately one year before their reelections, going back to the 1950s. The highest, Dwight Eisenhower, sitting on a 78% approval rating in 1955. Just below him, George H.W. Bush, at 59% approval in 1991. At the bottom of the list is our stamp-friendly friend, Harry Truman, at 23% approval in 1951. Just above Truman is Jimmy Carter at 32% approval. And just above Biden is former President Donald Trump at 41% in 2019. I'd like to play you another video clip of what our focus group voters are saying about Biden. Let's listen in and watch. Democrat, it, you know, 
And then their issue is, we don't like Biden. It's not that we don't like, you know, democratic values and, and, and that type of stuff. We would rather have a different candidate, but we, you know, we're not given that chance, you know what I mean? So that's probably why you haven't heard any, you know, you know, pro-Biden things, because even Democrats don't care for him or Republicans. So it's like, I don't know, you know. What's so, your opinion of President Biden? My opinion of President Biden is that when he first took office, it was a relief to me because I was so tired of the chaos of every day in the newspaper. There was something that the then president was doing or saying or being anti and antagonistic about or just confrontational about. And then when he was president, when Biden came in, it was just like you kind of got a break from that part of that, a break from that. But then you are now into this thing where um, is he really being effective? Like, can he be effective? Like, I agree with the whole age issue. But I, and someone had said, the way that elections run now, it's not as much as you voting for someone as it is you voting against the other person. Trump, on the other hand, love him or hate him, is benefiting from Biden's low approval ratings. You see, Trump is one of those candidates who has connected with the section of the American public because he says what he means and he means what he says. He was a consequential president, according to many historians. Sure, people cringe when they hear him speak because he has no filter, but many Americans give the former president credit for doing what he said he would do. This includes everything from starting the process of building a wall along the southern border to cutting taxes for millions of Americans and small businesses, to getting NATO countries to pay their fair share in defense spending as part of the global alliance, to putting three conservative justices on the U.S. Supreme Court in four years' time. But there was plenty wrong with Trump, according to his critics. For instance, according to the Presidential Greatness Project Expert Survey, discussed by CNN recently on their broadcast, Trump rates dead last as number 45 on a list of 45 presidents. Ranking as our greatest presidents in this new study are Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, and George Washington. So Trump ranks dead last in the category of, quote, greatness. And let's face it, Trump is one of those people that makes you cringe when you hear him speak. To many Democrats, he's a business crook who has shady business dealings and didn't pay his vendors and contractors. He's a racist who isn't afraid to side with Confederate sympathizers during debates about the Confederate flag, and a person who acts like a juvenile when he calls his opponent's names or makes fun of their clothing. I'd like to play you a short video clip of what one voter in particular, named Michael Sargent, has to say about Trump. Sargent, you see, considers himself a conservative Republican who voted for Trump in the past, but this time around is still on the fence. I would add sexist. I think, you know, when you were saying about racism, I would add, I mean, you know, this, you know, having a daughter, someone I did not want to on my, my daughter, um, the way he's, you know, he's treated women over the years. Um, it's obviously he had to pull of himself. I think, you know, David's point, you know, it's perfect that, you know, he's his own worst enemy. I think, you know, and, and, and this is where I struggle a lot, you know, and I've decided because. Well, there are some things that I like that he's put out there. There are some things I supported policy-wise of him. You know, the first time around, I did not vote for him the first time. I did vote for him the second time against Biden uh, because I liked some of the things he did. You didn't vote for him the first time. You mean you voted for Clinton the first time? No, I did not vote for Biden either. I voted Libertarian the first time. Gotcha. So, yeah. um, but um, some people say I turned the vote away, whatever. That was my choice. So, um, because I just couldn't get behind him. I thought he was arrogant, cocky, divisive, but I was concerned about what Brian was going to bring to the table, so um, I did vote for him. Um, and I will say I regret it, but you know, I just I look at, again, from a policy standpoint, I've been behind half of the things maybe he does, but then he opens his mouth. And it's like, I, I can't support someone, or I have a tough time at this point now supporting someone who 
I don't believe, as a prospective office, things went. I think was the biggest issue that I had with him. I don't think he but he respected or valued the office that he held. I think he always thought that he was above the office. Um, and that's what's got him troubled out of all and the duty to be one. I think the breath of fresh air from him was the fact that he's uh, a politician. And I think that's what a lot of people gravitate towards right now. Um, that someone is outside of, and I think that's where you know, people have a tough time understanding why this guy ever get in there. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly what got him in there the first time and why people did gravitate towards him because he's not the 40 year politician. You know, he's not someone that's been in there forever, and it was something new. But obviously, sometimes new and change is not necessarily the best thing. So, um, so that, that's where I come down, and that's why I'm undecided because I can't vote for him. I will not vote for him again, but I can't vote for where things are going right now. So, you know, just some of the Despite all this, and notwithstanding Mike Sargent's personal feelings, polling in many battleground states shows Trump and Biden in a close contest, but Trump clearly ahead in most. In Wisconsin, Trump leads by 1%. In Nevada, he leads by 56 In Georgia, he leads by 5.7%. In Arizona, he leads by 5.2. In Michigan, he leads by 3.5. And in the great state of Pennsylvania, Trump is the favorite by only 0.6%. That's half a percentage point. According to our most recent poll, conducted February 26th through March 7th, but not officially released until today, Biden narrowly leads Trump by five points in Pennsylvania, or a margin of 50 to 45. The poll's margin of error is 4.6%. So Biden's lead is just outside the polls sampling error by a hairline. Trump leads among Republicans by a 95 to 3 margin, while Biden leads among Democrats 91 to 2. So each of these candidates has secured a large share of their base. But the key reason why Biden is leading is that independents and swing voters are leaning towards him. These two subgroups of voters are key cohorts of the Pennsylvania population that exit polls show Biden won in 2020. For instance, among registered independents, Biden leads 71-25. Among self-described independents, which includes some Republicans and Democrats who consider themselves nonpartisans, Biden leads 73-24. Independent voters, according to analysis our firm conducted, were the fastest growing political party in the Commonwealth from 2010 to 2020 even outpacing new Republican and Democrat registrations in almost all counties. And among swing voters, or those who say they split their tickets in most elections, Biden leads 68 to 29. Ladies and gentlemen, these independent and swing voters are the linchpin to winning a purple state like Pennsylvania, mainly because the straight R or D ticket does not get you to 51%. And the recipe for Biden to again win here is not a secret. It's the same roadmap he used to win in 2020. In 2020, Biden won the Commonwealth by 82,000 votes out of more than 6.9 million votes cast, but only by winning 13 of Pennsylvania's 67 counties. That's it. These include Philadelphia, Bucks, Chester, Delaware, and Montgomery in the Southeast. Add to this Northampton, Lackawanna, Lehigh and Monroe in the Northeast, plus Dauphin, Center, Erie, and Allegheny, and you have the magic formula. But these 13 counties combined represent 56% of the state's total population. This next map I want to show you shows the regional groupings of how the Biden-Trump results look in our current poll and how those margins compare with the results of the Clinton-Trump election in 2016 in those same areas. Now the top number you see in each region in bold is the leader of that region in our current poll. Underneath it in smaller font is which candidate won that region in 2016. And of course red means Trump is leading, blue means Biden is leading. What it shows is that Biden is winning the Northwest Erie region the southeast collar counties around Philadelphia, plus Allegheny County and Philadelphia. Conversely, Trump is winning the southwest region, 
excluding Allegheny County, we mean, the conservative central T of the state, the Northeast Wilkes-Barre Scranton media market, and South Central PA or the Harrisburg media market. These are all the same areas Trump won in 2020. But the difference is that Trump has failed to make substantial inroads in either the Southeast or the state's major urban centers, although he is polling a little bit better in Philadelphia, as this map shows. But more importantly, Trump is underperforming his 2016 margins when you look at how he's doing today. Remember, in 2016, Trump defeated Clinton in Pennsylvania by racking up huge margins in the state's conservative counties. So if Trump is going to carry the Keystone State again, he needs to either match or exceed his 2016 numbers in those areas. In other key takeaways from this poll, moderate voters, which account for a larger share of the population than either conservatives or progressives, are leaning towards Biden 51 to 45. If Biden can hold this moderate cohort of the population, along with support from swing voters and independents, it probably cements his victory. And perhaps the biggest takeaway from the poll is that only 4% of the state's voters remain undecided. As we discussed before, our focus group with undecided voters can provide some clarity on this topic in terms of who these undecided voters might end up casting ballots for. When I pushed these eight undecided voters on who they'll vote for ultimately, and I had to push very hard with this group, three of them said they would lean towards Trump, assuming there was no other viable third party option to consider. But the remaining five said they would not commit to either candidate. This suggests Trump might benefit from these late breaking undecided voters, particularly because almost all of them said inflation and immigration were the top issues that would influence their votes. But the prospect of a third party candidate was discussed by the group, and it was clear to me that many of these participants seemed enthusiastic about the potential for a third party option. Let's listen to the group's reaction on this last clip I wanna share with you so you can see the reactions from the group. wanted to show you the enthusiasm among the group for, for a third party ticket. So ladies and gentlemen, here we are in late March, only seven short months 
away from Election Day, we have Trump and Biden in a close contest, both nationally and in Pennsylvania. Will undecided voters vote for a third party candidate? Will these so-called double haters instead hold their noses and vote for the nominee of their political party? And what will independent voters do? Things like the state of the economy, the prospect of a no labels party, and how the candidates conduct themselves in their campaigns over the intervening seven months will ultimately shape the eventual outcome. So stay tuned for our polling in coming months as we continue to track the election, both nationally and here in the battleground state of PA. I want to close by using just two extra minutes to talk about something of personal and professional consequence to both myself and the survey profession. Our industry these days is under a microscope and some would say even under siege. Many of us probably know it. There are so many conflicting polls out there and in high profile years like this year that only adds to the confusion and the chaos. Many even question how people in our business can get reliable samples of interviews these days given that no one likes to be called at home anymore to conduct surveys. But I take our responsibility at SPNR seriously, to you first, and to our customers and clients. At our firm, we strive to protect the integrity of our surveys, which means everything from defending the wording in our polls to defending our results, regardless of which political party it benefits. We're constantly pledging to improve our techniques and refine our ways of collecting survey data. This means using many forms of data collection, including emails, text messages, and focus group research, in addition to traditional telephone polling. We could not do a good job for our clients without exceptional teamwork from our staff and consultants, including some who are here today, like Bradley Hausch, Brian Han, Carolyn Macharaju, and Carlton Shank, who were all instrumental in preparing today's focus group presentation. This means consulting with our industry partner, the American Association of Public Opinion Research on Best Practices, and it means working extra hard to make sure our clients know we're doing our level best to improve the practices and even the ethics of our trade. This benefits not only our industry in the short term, but the integrity and reputation of our profession for the long term. Thank you very much, everybody. Our, our polling is showing that we just completed this recent survey and the abortion issue is still polling exceptionally high with Democrat voters. And now that in vitro fertilization has now become the cause celeb for some organizations who feel their rights are being threatened, we're seeing a resurgence of the abortion issue. But overall among all voters, we're not seeing abortion has the same resonance as it did just two years ago. As I said, it's polling very high with Democrats, and I think that the Biden campaign will try to make abortion a fundamental top of mind issue because they're having difficulty running on what polling does show, which is that the economy, inflation, and immigration are really the top issues that most voters care about in our survey. So I think the Biden administration, Francine, will make a con concerted effort to make sure abortion remains top of mind on um, protecting democracy. In our focus group, we had a list of 10 issues. We asked people to pick which top three were their most important issues. No one mentioned it. I think it's definitely an issue that resonates, again, with many Democratic voters who feel we can never have another January 6th. But I question whether that will really motivate swing voters and independents at the polls in November. Why do your polls show Biden winning and many others show Trump winning? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, it, it should be no surprise that Democrats are leading in Pennsylvania. Um, I mean, think about where we are in 2024 and the year we just came off in 2023 when Democrats swept the statewide races for judicial courts and in 2022 Democrats swept the U.S. Senate race and the governor's race here in Pennsylvania. So it shouldn't be a shock that there's still Democratic momentum in our polling. Now to this issue of our polling and how it compares with other polls that have Trump leading, in 2016 folks, 
there was something called the shy Trump vote that many pollsters missed. In other words, people were afraid to say to a pollster on the phone they supported Donald Trump because he was being called so many horrible things. And a lot of polling missed Trump's real support on election day because voters were reluctant to share that with people that called them for a survey. I think what we have now is the reverse of that happening, where the enthusiasm right now is with Donald Trump, and they're the ones conducting telephone surveys. So if you don't make an extra effort to make sure you can account and adjust for that with statistical weighting, you're going to produce polls that overstate Donald Trump's support, unlike in 2016 when his support was understated. I believe that's why our polling is spot on and shows Biden with a narrow lead in the Commonwealth. Now, having said that, Jimmy Carter trailed, excuse me, led Ronald Reagan in March of 1980. And um, there's many cases when um, the polling can drastically change in seven, eight months time. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens in the future, but I believe the polling is, is accurate as of, as of today. With small samplings of voters, three to 400, how is that indicative of an entire district or state? That's a good question on methodology. Polling is like filling up a, a swimming pool with red, blue, and white marbles. Red being re, uh, Republican voters, blue being Democrat voters, white being independent voters. You mix it real good. If you mix it really good, and you have an equal amount of voters from each party in that swimming pool, every scoop you make should give you the right proportion of marbles or balls based on the proportion of the electorate. When we do polling, we try to get a scientific snapshot of the state. And it's not so much how many interviews we're collecting as it is what type of interview we're getting. Do we have the balance between Republicans and Democrats correct? Does that mirror the voter registration of the state? Did we get the right amount of surveys from each region of the Commonwealth? For instance, Philadelphia and the four suburban collar counties. As a group, those five counties make up one in three votes cast in a statewide election, one in three. So in a statewide poll, one in three interviews will be with someone in those five counties. So polling is really more about quality and less about quantity, so the size of your sample doesn't matter as much as making sure you get the right mix of respondents to answer polling. Did your polling show Hillary winning in 2016? We had Hillary Clinton leading by two points in our last poll in the 2016 cycle. I think the margin for Donald Trump was about a point or slightly under one, one percentage point. So the margin of error of a poll is certainly helpful. It means there's a little bit of sampling error included but we had Hillary Clinton leading by two points um, that year. Why haven't Democrats selected another candidate? Would Buttigieg, Whitman, or Shapiro do better in the general election? Wow. I mean, I, you know, here, here's the thing. Um, you have two types of campaigns this year being run. You have hope voters which are people that support Donald Trump, and they're voting for Donald Trump. Our polling shows a Trump voter is voting for Trump. They're hopeful he will win and take the country in a new direction. On the other hand, you have fear voters. These are people that are very soft on Joe Biden's performance. You saw it. They don't particularly care for the man. They still support democratic principles, but they're voting out of fear that the other guy is going to get in. And that's the different choice we have in this election. So substituting someone like Josh Shapiro, we'll never really know if he would have been a better candidate. But that's why the prospect of a third party candidate could make the difference in these elections. I'll never forget in 1992 in the state of Minnesota, George Bush lost to Bill Clinton because Ross Perot got 24 percent of the vote that year. George Bush got 32%. Bill Clinton was only in the low 40s. That caused Bush to lose the state of Minnesota because Ross Perot polled at 24%, for those of you that have a memory that goes back that far. So the advent of these third party candidates really will 
could make the difference in Pennsylvania and a lot of these critical swing states. Um, the Libertarian Party is on 37 state ballots, by the way. The No Labels Party, as I mentioned, 22 ballots they've already qualified, qualified for, 22. The Green Party qualified for 21 ballots. Robert Kennedy, he's already qualified for eight ballots, and there's more on the docket for him. Cornell West is on four ballots already. The Constitutional Party, 13. There is plenty of third party vote out there that will go somewhere other than Trump or Clinton, this, uh, excuse me, Trump or Biden this year. Are polls still relevant? Oh boy, is my, is my mom here? Did she ask that question? <laughs> mom, are you? Yes, yes. Um, I think polls are still relevant. They're a snapshot in time, but I think by and large, polling gives you a roadmap to election day. They're used very strategically and surgically to help candidates identify where their strong or weak areas are. Like I said earlier, if I was advising the Trump campaign, I tell them they have not moved numbers in the key counties of Pennsylvania where they need to move numbers in order to win a state like Pennsylvania. They're underperforming in the areas of the state where Trump did well in in 2016 and 2020, but they are not matching those numbers. So polling is very relevant, and believe it or not, many people still like to be called at home for surveys. What are the most notable political trends you've observed over the years? Um, probably the growth in independent voters. I mentioned earlier um, the, the analysis our firm conducted that shows independent voters now are overperforming Republicans and Democrats in new registrations. That says to me more and more people are growing dissatisfied with the current structure of our electoral system in terms of just having an R or a D that they can vote for. And there's growing dissatisfaction, I think, across the board from voters on that. In your opinion, is there a formula to being politically successful in Pennsylvania? Can you repeat that, Francine? In your opinion, is there a formula to being politically successful in Pennsylvania? Um, I, I mean, I guess I'll answer that personally and professionally. To be politically successful, I think transparency is obviously fundamental. Uh, no matter what business you're in, if you're in a lobbying organization, if you're an elected official, being transparent with your constituents, um, being trustworthy, standing behind your product, whatever it is, I think they're all the qualities you want in, um, in terms of being successful in the political arena. We'd like to thank Jim and wish him well. We have some mementos for him. These gifts are compliments of PCN and Pennsylvania Press Club. In closing, we'd like to thank you for being with us. Our next luncheon is Monday, April 29th, when our guest will be Pennsylvania Secretary of Education, Khalid Moomin. For scheduling information, visit our website, papressclub.org. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Well, we got it in time, yeah, right? Yeah, we did. Yeah, perfect.